such a pleasure. It's a privilege to get to talk to you. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be with you today. Amazing. So before we kick this off, I was uh, thinking back about a conversation I had on the show recently with Dr. William Lee. And uh, Dr. Lee said to me that uh, when he thinks about health, most people just think about it in terms of the absence of disease. But really, there's a lot more to, to that. And I was looking around my friendship group. I mean, I'm 24. I'm a young guy. I've got a, a lot of friends. And it was notable that a lot of them had aches and pains. They were suffering with fatigue, you know. They <laughs> And I was looking around at, at, you know, different people I know. And it just seems to me as if there are very few people which I would say in terms of their physical health are actually thriving. So... Why are people in the West so sick? Well, certainly, um, as, as you can imagine, a lot of it comes down to what we have for breakfast and what we have for lunch and what we have for dinner and what we have all in between those times. Because you can, in the same way as you can, when you're filling up your car at the filling station, you can put in the gasoline that it's intended for or you can accidentally put diesel in a car that takes unleaded and everything is going to go wrong. So I think that's kind of what it is. Our bodies prefer unleaded, and a lot of people are putting in diesel. I love it. So it's interesting reading your body in balance. You are a proponent of a low-fat, whole food, plant-based diet. So I find this completely fascinating when I consider your backstory in that you grew up on a farm in North Dakota. <laughs> so I wonder how how do, how do those two things uh, co-inspire? Well, I have to say, you know, for, for, before I dive into kind of how I got here, I, I should say that um, what we're really talking about is big stuff. Um, the, the, there are so many people who are suffering now. Um, there are, imagine, say, a couple dealing with infertility and and year after year they're going they're spending a fortune on testing and treatments and so forth um, or a young woman who's dealing with with say menstrual pain that every single month is leaving her out of work um, or a guy who's got prostate cancer and he's wondering if he's going to survive these are, are serious issues but what they all have in common is that they relate to hormones and people don't think about hormones what are hormones hormones are chemicals that are made in one part of your body and they travel through the bloodstream to, to dictate what the rest of your body is going to do. They determine a lot of your health. And most people have absolutely no idea that your breakfast determines hormone levels. And your lunch is, does the same and your dinner does the same. And people are eating willy-nilly, not realizing that that's going to change their reproductive hormones and their thyroid hormone and everything. So they can feel rotten uh, or they can feel great um, or their reproduction can work well or not or whatever. So um, that to me is exciting. And I recognize that that's new. For many people, you think, wait a minute, I figured food would either make me gain weight or lose weight or make my cholesterol go up or down. Now we're talking about a whole completely new universe of health issues, and I get it. And that's why that's why I wrote this book, um, Your Body in Balance, is, is for people who are dealing with hormonal issues that relate to reproduction. I'm talking about uh, a woman who's got cramps or endometriosis or PCOS or is worried about breast cancer or a guy who has erectile dysfunction or fertility problems, or people with thyroid issues or diabetes or mood things, all these things are so mysterious and hard to figure, and I wanted to boil it down, make it simple, help people to figure out which foods help. So anyway, with that long-winded preamble, you said, like, how does somebody from Fargo get into, the, into all this? Um, the year before I went to medical school, I had a job in a hospital. I was the, I was, I was the morgue attendant. That was my job. So, yes, somebody died in the hospital, and I would have to prepare the body for an examination by the pathologist. Uh, and one day, we had a guy die in the hospital of a massive heart attack, probably from eating hospital food, but that's another issue. So anyway, um, the, guy, the guy was dead. He had a heart attack. Um, and the pathologist cut a big chunk of ribs right off the front of his chest, um, which you do not do with great delicacy. You slice through the skin and peel it back and you take a clipper, like a garden clipper, and you go crunch, crunch, crunch through the ribs and you pull the ribs off. And that exposed the heart, which was diseased. You could you could see that the heart had, was severely damaged. Um, and so the pathologist knew that I was going to be going to medical school. 
and he made sure I saw everything. He sliced open a coronary artery. He said, look, look inside. So I had gloves on. I could feel inside. And the, the, the artery, it's, an artery should feel kind of rubbery uh, because it allows the blood to go through. But this was crispy, like filled with sand. And it was, he said, that's, that's cholesterol. Wow, it's amazing. And we looked at the arteries to the brain, and they had the same thing, meaning the person was headed for a stroke, but the heart attack killed him first. At the end of the exam, he left. I had to clean everything up. So I put the ribs back in the chest, and I sewed up the skin, and you know, it sponged everything, everything down. And I went up to the cafeteria when I was done. And they were serving ribs for lunch. And it smelled like the body, and it, and it looked like the body. And I thought, this is a body. And I didn't become a vegetarian on the spot, but I, could not, I couldn't eat it. I just said, like, no. And it started this process of thinking through, like, what is it that um, we're putting in our mouths? And I started to connect food and disease and death. And the more I learned about it, the more I realized that getting away from animal products is obviously the way to go. Very interesting. And all the people that I've interviewed, I mean, there's been uh, Dr. William Lee, Dr. Bolshevitz. I mean, I interviewed Dr. B twice. Um, then Michael Greger, then uh, the master in diabetes guys. And it's been a common theme. You've got to speak to Neil Barnard. You've got to speak to Neil Barnard. Uh, it's incredible the work in which you do. You're highly, highly respected in this field. So well, there's no accounting for taste, but thank you. <laughs> so let's get really meta in terms of um, your book. So the book is called Your Body and Balance, a new suit of the new science of food, hormones and health. Let's focus specifically on the hormones part for now, because that's what we'll be talking about today. How would you define a hormone and what is the job of a hormone? OK, hormones are chemical messengers they've got directions to tell your body what to do so they're made in one part of your body they go in the bloodstream they go somewhere else and say this is what we're going to do today so in a woman's body the ovaries make estrogens estrogens are hormones they go in the blood and they go to the uterus and they go to the other reproductive organs and they they cause changes in those organs um, the thyroid hormone the, the the thyroid gland is at the base of your neck and it makes thyroid hormone that goes through the blood to the to the cells of the body to give them energy. It says, okay, wake up, let's get with it. Um, or in a man's body, the testes make testosterone. It goes in the blood, and I guess it goes to his brain, and it makes him want to run for president, I guess. So anyhow, <laughs> the, the, a hormone, okay, just kidding. A, the, a hormone is uh, a chemical that's made in one part of the body to give directions to the rest of the body. And when things are going wrong, you've got all kinds of problems. I'll, I'll give you an example. Sitting at my desk one day and the phone rang and it was a woman with, with menstrual cramps, a young woman. She said, I've got a business trip out of town tomorrow, but I can't get out of bed. And for, for about one in 10 women, cramps are so bad every single month that they just really can't function and they're taking fistfuls of ibuprofen and whatever. So she, she wanted help. And I said, all right, I can give you some painkillers for now. But I started thinking, what's the deal with cramps? And I, I, I made an, well, I, I suggested to her that she take painkillers for now, but for the next four weeks before her next period, no animal products in your diet, you're going to become a vegan and keep oils really low. Now this kind of surprised her, like, what are you talking about? Why, why should I do that? I said, let's just do this as an experiment. And she called back a month later and said, this is amazing. She had a normal period, zero cramps, and it was, it was her cure. Um, now, let, let me go back to why I suggested this. Researchers have been looking at hormones for breast cancer because if you got a breast, can, a breast cell that becomes a cancer cell, estrogen fuels the growth of that cell. So it will grow and expand and spread it and it could kill you. And so researchers have said estrogen is trouble. You know, you need a little bit for reproduction, but you don't need the excess that could make the cancer cells grow. So researchers brought a large group of women, they put them, they locked them up in a research ward and they fed them a variety of diets and they found certain things. High fiber diets, talking about beans and grains and vegetables, cause the body to excrete a little extra estrogen. So it brings estrogen down. And they found that high fat diets, 
bacon grease, chicken fat, fish oil. Those things make estrogens go up. So they said, wait a minute, if you don't want to get cancer, let's keep your estrogens inbound, high fiber, low fat. So as the woman was calling me with cramps, I thought, what are cramps? Cramps are the uterus is changing every month and it's changing too much. You're the technical part is the inner lining of the uterus, the endometrium, thickens up in response to estrogen. If it thickens up too much, you just hurt at the end of the month. Um, so by changing her diet to a vegan diet, it's really high fiber, really low in fat, and that would bring her estrogen down and make her feel good. But anyway, the, the point I'm making here, that was just the door in. And once we walked through that door, we then did a research study to see if it works for women more broadly, and it does. Um, and in the course of this, we also found that it could affect fertility and it could affect endometriosis and all kinds of things. So we discovered if I can control my hormones, if I can learn what the heck they are, and in kind of the same way somebody gives you a car and the keys, but you never have driven before, you, you've got to figure out how this works. But once you know how to drive, you got power. And once you know how to control your hormones, you can bring your health to a completely different level than it's been on. I want to come back to the uh, sex-related cancers in just a moment, but you mentioned fertility. And didn't, in one of your research trials, this new approach actually give way to a woman giving birth that didn't think that she could? Yeah, we, this is something we've seen this. Uh, in the first case, what, you're right. Um, we were working at Georgetown University, and all we wanted to do was to test whether a low-fat plant-based diet really would help with menstrual cramps in a randomized trial. A large group of women came in, some of them started the diet, some of them did not, and whatever, and, and it worked great. But in, in the course of this study, we asked all the women to not use any hormone medications because that would goof up the study, but that means the pill. So we said, if you're sexually active, please use some other kind of contraception. And one of the women in the study said, forget it, don't worry about me, I'm completely infertile. I said, well, how do you know? She said, well, my husband and I have been trying for years, and we were both evaluated, and he's, it's not him. It's me. I don't ovulate. You know, it's, I'm just infertile. That's the way. So, so don't worry. I don't use hormones of any kind. I don't use the pill. The second month that she was on the plant-based diet, she came into our center. She said, Dr. Barnard, I've got bad news, and I've got good news. I said, well, what do you mean? She says, the bad news is I'm leaving your study. And the good news is I am pregnant. <laughs> and she couldn't believe it. She was pregnant like, like, like that. And then about maybe eight or nine years later, I saw her again. She came to one of my lectures. She had three kids with her. These are all her kids. So anyway, the, the point I made, and, she, and she's not the only one. I mean, there are other uh, cases. Um, the case of Catherine Lawrence, uh, who I described, she was in the Air Force uh, over in Iraq. And when you're in a war zone, you know, you don't eat well, you don't, you don't, you don't get any weight, gain any weight. Uh, but once you got back to Louisiana, um, tucked into gumbo, cheese, <laughs> all kinds of things, she gained weight. And she developed endometriosis, which is a very painful condition where cells are growing in your abdomen that are fueled by estrogen. S exact same story. She, she, was, she was scheduled for a hysterectomy be, to, to control her because her, she had out of control endometriosis medication couldn't stop it and she was only 27 didn't want to have a hysterectomy um, because I mean that means you're not gonna have kids but her doctor said look the endometriosis has almost certainly rendered you infertile anyway ah. so she, she she scheduled the hysterectomy before she could have it she had six weeks before she could have it she went on the diet that I just described no animal products really low fat she started feeling better and better and better and better. And by the time, when, when it came time for the hysterectomy, the doctor opened her up. And an hour later, I mean, she was sedated. An hour later, the doctor wakes her up in the recovery room and says, Catherine, I got some news for you. Your endometriosis is gone. And he, she had some scarring where it had been and some adhesions where it had been that could cause some continuing, continuing pain. So he just freed up the, the scars, removed the adhesions. Um, and she was fine. And so she, she never had the, the hysterectomy and she no longer had endometriosis. And she, she has now three children of her own. So anyway, here's, here's my point. So many people have imagined that health is just can't really be changed much by food. That there's, there's not really a lot you can do. And if you're infertile, that's God's will. It's probably not God's will. It's probably 
the will of Velveeta or, you know, the McDonald's or somebody <laughs> like that. But it has nothing to do with a deity. Um, uh, and, you know, that, well, I'm older or it's genetic. There's nothing I can do. Well, maybe, you know, I mean, you know, our bodies, you, you can have problems. But a lot of the health issues we deal with are hormones gone awry. And once people know what they are, they can do better. And we've talked about women's issues, but that's true for men. It's true for older folks who don't want to have uh, diabetes. They want to conquer breast cancer, prostate cancer. They want to conquer their thyroid problems. They want to get their energy back. All that is possible uh, with a healthy diet. Yeah. And one of the things which you really hammer home in the book is the relationship between foods and things like estrogen and testosterone so i want to focus on that with the impact on things like breast and prostate cancer how does food impact the sex related cancers yeah in a major way and this has become well let's let's focus on men for a minute with prostate cancer when i was in medical school we were taught that all men will eventually get prostate cancer it just it just has to do with being old but then researchers said, well, wait a minute. At Harvard, they brought in a large group of men, of men 21,000 men. And those men who consumed the most dairy were 34% more likely to get prostate cancer. The men who avoided dairy, less likely. They thought, oh, that's interesting. Let's see if it's really true. They did another study, 48,000 men, the health professionals follow-up study. And now it was dairy increased cancer risk about 60%. So the men who, the men who said glass of milk, no way. Cheese, I don't eat it. Their risk of prostate cancer is dramatically less. What's that about? We know that prostate cancer, the prostate is this organ right below a man's bladder. Nature put it there to drive poor men crazy. Um, and it causes all kinds of symptoms uh, as, it en as it enlarges. But cancer cells can form in the prostate. Very, very common. When a man drinks milk, something happens in his body very much like what happens when a calf drinks milk from the mother cow, which is the calf's, milk helps the calf grow. Milk has sugars in it, lactose, sugar, proteins, fats, and hormones. And in the calf's body, it causes certain hormone-like substances called IGF-1, is insulin-like growth factor number one, and others, to increase in amount. And that makes the calf grow. Now, you're a fully grown man, it can make cancer cells grow. Um, we're pushed to drink milk, you need it for calcium, you need it for protein, da, 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 da. There are healthier sources of all those things that are not gonna cause cancer. Mm. And it's interesting as well, because in your work in terms of uh, men's health, you talk about things like erectile dysfunction. And I think you, you said a line in the book that was something like, uh, don't reach for Viagra, reach for vegetables. <laughs> Right. And I, sorry, can you just talk about this? Because I love this. We see this every day. Uh, I, we have a clinic here at the Physicians Committee. And every clinic is like this. A guy goes into the clinic and he sees the doc and he says to the doc, oh, you know, doc, I can't raise the flag. You know, <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 patients have all kinds of euphemisms for these things. <laughs> and so the, the doctor says, you want a Viagra prescription, right? And the patient says, yeah, that's what I need, doc. And so the doc says, well, I can give you that. And so the patient snatches the prescription and says, thanks, doc. And he walks out, you know, the doctor drops his pen, races out the door and grabs the patient before he goes down the elevator and says, we're not finished. You got to come back and sit down. And the doctor sits down with the patient and says, this Viagra, that might help you tonight. But let me tell you what erectile dysfunction means. It means it's not performance anxiety. The reason that you can't get an erection is you don't have blood flow. You know, the, the male sexual anatomy, what causes it to change is blood flow. You get a lot of blood flow and you get an erection. You don't have it. It doesn't happen. So if a man has erectile dysfunction, he's 55 years old, he's generally healthy, he thinks, but he suddenly has this erectile dysfunction, that's a sign that the arteries to his private parts are narrowing and narrowing and narrowing so there's not blood getting through anymore. And erectile dis uh, uh, Viagra will, will momentarily enlarge those arteries and then they close down again. Um, but what the doctor explains to the patient is that you, if you've got narrowed arteries there, that's a sign that you've got narrowed arteries to your heart muscle and you're gonna have a heart attack. You've got artery narrowings in the arteries that are feeding your brain. You are at much higher risk of a stroke than other people. 
And, and I'm not talking long term. I'm talking about within the next three to five years. So if I got your attention, patient, um, go ahead and take your Viagra tonight. But that's not going to reverse any of this. What reverses the artery disease is to get the cholesterol out of your diet and the animal fat out of your diet. And if you do those things, you have a shot. I'm talking about a completely plant-based diet. You have a shot of those arteries healing naturally. That'll prevent the heart attack, help you reduce the risk of a stroke. And with regard to your private parts, one of the really common side effects we see in our clinic is that erectile dysfunction goes away um, without any drugs at all. Uh, so that, that will take um, some weeks, but, but it does happen. And it's the, I gotta tell you, it makes patients really like the taste of that vegan food. <laughs> Yeah, the tofu must taste awfully sweet with that. Uh, I, I, I want to loop back on this because I want to touch back as we're on the sex-related cancers. I want to zoom back around and look at the female side. So I think that there's so much confusion here, especially I'm based in the UK, I'm in Wales, and I hear it all the time, and it drives me pretty mad, this take that soy is so damaging to people's health. Where do you stand on soy? Well, um, what they're thinking of is, is this, that soy, soybeans have compounds in them called isoflavones. And those were identified back in the 1930s. And the concern started because the isoflavones appear to attach to the estrogen receptor. Um, so uh, if you take a test tube and you put breast cells in them, the uh, isoflavones from soy can attach to the receptor. So people started to speculate, well, could that cause cancer? Well, we've had more than enough time to study that. And if you look at large groups of women um, who consume different amounts of soy, and then you track who's getting cancer and who, who isn't. Uh, in fact, you, you could take uh, the, 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 the groups that are most effective to study are Asian women or Asian American women, for example, where some consume a phenomenal amount of soy, you know, tofu, soy milk, um, miso, and so forth on a daily basis, and others may not have them. So it gives you a really good ability to, 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 to look at the question. And the data are really clear. And that is, uh, soy does affect cancer risk in the following way. The women consuming the most soy products have 30% less likelihood of getting cancer, or maybe more, maybe 40% less risk. So, so soy doesn't cause cancer, it does the opposite, it reduces the risk quite a lot, 30, 40%. Um, so, yes, soy products reduce cancer risk, but more than that, researchers have looked at women who have had cancer in the past. She was diagnosed, she was treated, um, what happens now? And it turns out that women consuming the most soy, again, have about a 30% reduction in the likelihood of dying of their cancer. So why would all this be? Um, and you can get the answer by going down your, your stairs, walking out to the street and getting in your car. And you look down at the pedals on the floor of your car. And on the right, it, or I'm sorry, you're in Wales. Um, probably on the left, you've got the gas. Well, I forget. I got the gas on the right. I got the gas on your the gas right. Your gas on the right. Same as us. Okay, same as us. Great. The steering wheel is on the right. Our steering wheel is on the other side. All right, your right foot hits the gas. Right next to it is another pedal. And that pedal is the brake. Now, if you step on the gas, the car goes. If you step on the brake, the car stops. Um, isoflavones attach, they don't attach to the alpha receptor so much. They attach per preferentially to the beta receptor. So you can think of soy as the brake. And if you've got no brakes in your car, you're in trouble. Um, so the idea about soy and, and breast cancer is an important one, but we now re strongly encourage women to make soy part of their life. It's good in a couple ways. One is in, in and of itself, these chemical effects are helpful. But the other part of it is it's replacing something that would not have been good for you. If instead of a hamburger, you have the soy veggie burger, or instead of cow's milk, you have soy milk or soy yogurt, that is dramatically better than what it replaces. Now, let me be clear, you don't need soy. And I think all things in balance, you know, you, you don't want to have only soy, but it does seem to be beneficial and it reduces the risk of developing cancer or dying of it. It's interesting how you talk about uh, the sort of the opportunity cost by consuming it, you're not consuming something else. And I've got a friend that um, was really big into bodybuilding and physique, uh, you know, the physique side of things. And he was typically eating four meals a day. 
and he decided to switch that to just one meal per day, so one big meal a day. So he was fasting for probably about 23 hours. And um, what he noticed was that by fasting, uh, he is he just felt entirely better. He noticed his strength went up, his bo- his body fat decreased to a certain extent. And we were trying to ponder on why this was. And he, there were still some animal uh, products in there. But what my theory is, is that he cut out a, you know, but by fasting, he cut out the chance to consume Twinkies or Mars bars or, you know, the eggs and bacon for breakfast. So where do you stand on fasting? Um, I think fasting is okay. Um, if there are people who do it in, in a number of ways and uh, for particularly severe uh, autoimmune conditions, for example, fasting has been therapeutic for many people. But I do have a couple cautions. Uh, one is if you're going to do a serious fast, and by that I mean several days or longer, not just like one meal a day, okay, you're not going to hurt yourself. But if you're, if you're really fasting for a week or more, um, it's something to do under supervision from a, a, a medical people who know what you're doing because it, it can be dangerous. The second thing is um, if some people are fasting, uh, there's kind of been a fad now, eat five days and fast two days. Um, uh, so on the weekend, people eat only tiny amounts or something like that. You can, you can do that, but um, very rapidly, people know that they're going to be fasting. So they start overeating on the other days. And then as time goes on, they're not so happy with their results. And I have to say a plant-based diet is in a way – a way of getting the same benefits while still eating because think about it if you're eating meat meat doesn't have any fiber in it at all it's a mixture of protein and fat plus the occasional parasite but it's but with regard to nutrients it's uh, protein and fat um, if I eat beans or vegetables it's got protein it's got traces of fat but it has a lot of fiber in it fiber fills you up but fiber doesn't have calories so that brings down your calorie intake in a healthy way without you having to go hungry so it can help people to kind of accomplish what they're doing in a little bit different way. I love it. I love it. One of the other major topics I'd love to delve into in your book is you talk about um, a low-fat, plant-based diet also being key for regulating metabolism. Now, this I drew real interest in, and this was something that my own mother had actually been suffering with. So I wonder, how does it actually do this? We discovered this a number of years ago, and it's true. Um, People will come into our research center. They come in at 6 o'clock in the morning. They just got out of bed. They got in their car. They come in because we're expecting them. They haven't had breakfast. And we measure their metabolism. But when I say metabolism, I mean how fast is your body burning calories? And uh, she might be 55 years old, and she'll say, I got no metabolism anymore. When When I was 12, I could eat anything. But now I just look at food, I gain weight, I'm obviously not burning calories. Well, we can measure it. And the way we do it is you lie down on an exam table, and we have a, it almost looks like a helmet. It's a plastic, kind of clear plastic globe that goes over your face and your, and your uh, neck and your shoulders as you're lying there. And I'm measuring how much carbon dioxide you're breathing out and how much oxygen you're taking in. And that's directly proportional to your, your metabolism, how fast your cal- your if your body is burning up a lot of calories, you're consuming a lot of oxygen. So we, we can measure this real easily. Um, and then uh, once I've measured your metabolism and you're right, it's low, then I give you breakfast. And, at, and I'm going to give you a standardized breakfast and your metabolism starts to rise. And then I'm going to – and I measure how much it rises. That always happens. It happens for everybody if with a mixed breakfast. Now – for the next 14 weeks or so, I'm going to make you a vegan. We're going to eat only plant foods. We're going to keep oils low too. And at the end of that time, you'll have lost weight, and your cholesterol is better and so forth. But, but let's come back in the laboratory and let's check specifically your metabolism. You lie down on the table, put the same globe over your face, and I'm measuring your metabolism. And then I give you breakfast. I, in fact, I'm going to give you the very same breakfast I gave you before. But your metabolism isn't the same at all. It's higher than it was before. For during the after meal period, you're now burning 15, 16% faster than you were before. Um, now, that's not a lot, but 
what if for three hours after breakfast you're burning calories about 15, 16 percent more than you were before? And you do it again after lunch, you do it again after dinner. Why is it the vegans are the skinniest people on the block? It's because they're taking in fewer calories because it's high fiber, low fat food, just naturally lowering calories. And their metabolism is a little bit better after every meal than it was before. So yeah, you can change your metabolism and it happens right away. Um, and the studies we do, we usually give it, you know, maybe three months or four months before we test it again. But the changes start occurring in, in your body on day one. See, this is really interesting to me because I always thought that weight was just a matter of a well, weight gain or loss was simply a matter of calories in versus calories out. And then my good friend, Dr. Will Bolshevitz, he tells me, no, no, Joe, the microbiome plays a major role in this. Um, so I was like, okay, you know, I imagine it, it might do. Then I started tracking calories with my own mother and I started realizing that, okay, um, you know, maybe metabolism and the microbiome does play a part in this. So just in terms of uh, the actual food and the whole food plant-based diet, what, what impact is that actually having on the metabolism? Well, uh, over the short run, what happens is that if, let's say you're eating fat, mm. uh, I'm going to eat a big steak, or I'm going to eat a salmon filet, which is, you know, if it's Chinook salmon, 52% fat. Um, those fat grams that come out of the salmon, they go down my esophagus, they don't stimulate metabolism much at all. They, get, they go through the bloodstream and they add to body fat, which is why people who eat a lot of fish tend to be portly. Um, but that's true for chicken fat or any other kind of fat. Um, fat does not stimulate the metabolism. What stimulates the metabolism over the short run is particularly carbohydrate and protein as well. Um, so let's say I'm eating, instead of the fish or animal products, or don't eat cheese, I mean, it's 70% fat. Um, let's say instead I'm eating a bean. A, I'm going to eat a plate of beans. They're only about 4% fat. Compare that with, as I said, 50% for the Chinook salmon. Um, but what beans have is protein and carbohydrate. So I get a good burn afterwards. But there's something more than that. Um, day by day, you get a better burn from, from foods that provide healthy plant-based uh, proteins and plant-based carbohydrate. Um, however, over the long run, when you get the fatty foods out of your diet, that means that the fat actually starts draining out of your muscles and draining out of your liver. So without all that fat in your muscle tissue and without the fat in your liver, your body can actually burn calories more efficiently over the long run. So it's partly an acute meal effect, but it's more importantly a longer term effect of having healthier cells. That's really interesting. That's really interesting. Um, what is the effect of having adipose fat, uh, extra fat on your body? What, what effect does that actually have it? Well, your body is trying to store it. It says, would you please stop eating the burgers if you don't mind? And you keep eating it. And so your body says, all right, what am I going to do with all this fat that's coming down? Your body tries to store it. That's the whole point of belly fat and thigh fat and fat on your derriere is your body's trying to get it out of the way. And the more you we eat, the heavier we get, and your body's trying to sequester this fat away. The problem is the body can never really succeed at that. Um, so much as it tries to get it out of the way, some of that fat is going to sneak inside your muscle cells. And some of that fat is going to sneak in your liver cells. I'm instead of going into body fat, it's going into the cells that are trying to work with you. And the more it gets into your muscle cells and liver cells, then, then it interferes with insulin. Now, I know this is I don't want to get overly complex, but insulin is a hormone that works on the muscle cells. It works on the liver cells to get sugar out of your blood, to get it into those cells, to power them. So suddenly the fatty foods pack fat into the muscle and liver cells. Insulin can't do its job anymore because the cells all gummed up with fat. And then your blood sugar starts to rise. And your doctor says, you've got diabetes. You say, what? How did I get diabetes? You got diabetes from eating fatty foods that pack the fat into your muscle and liver, and that stops insulin from being able to work, and now your blood sugar just goes up and up and up and up and up. And then so for the rest of their life, people don't eat sugar, or they don't eat bread, they, they thought that was the issue. That was never the issue. The issue was the fat getting into the cell. Really, do you not take a stance against sugar at all? Well, d don't get me wrong. Um, if it's natural sugars, like in an apple or an orange or a banana, I mean, those those are, are healthy for you. In fact, sugar is 
like your Ferrari drives on gasoline, you know, your, your body thrives on glucose. That's the natural sugar you need. Your brain needs glucose. If you don't have it, you're on the floor dead. Yeah. Um, so sugar is a good thing in that respect. Where, where it's not so good is that people take sugar cane and they throw away all the fiber and so forth and they pack the sugar, the, pack that into candy or they'll take sugar beets and throw away all the pulp and all the fiber and then they take the sugar, that refined sugar and they'll put it in a drink and they'll call it Dr. Pepper which is not a medical drink despite the name. Um, and so the, these artificial sugars are not health, uh, healthy for us. Yeah, it's interesting. I'd love to link my own personal experience here into your work. So uh, quite a while ago, I watched um, Michael Pollan's In Defense of Food, this great documentary, and he simplified this journey he went on. And I remember he said, eat plants. No, sorry. He said, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And once I listened to that, I thought, okay, I want to make the one decision that removes a hundred later decisions. So to the best of my ability, I'm just going to try to stick to only food, essentially. I'm going to try to avoid the middle aisles as best as I could. And what I noticed that by doing this, it w it felt like I was in the matrix because of how much my thinking improved. It was like, like I thought I could like bend walls with my thoughts. <laughs> so yeah. I'd love to know, what is the impact between uh, nutrition, the food in which we eat, and also perhaps uh, brain fog or perhaps even mental health? There are several really important things. Um, one of the things that has concerned me in particular is the risk of Alzheimer's disease. I mean, make a list of all the diseases you never want to get in your life, and number the top of the list is Alzheimer's disease, because, I mean, you lose everything. And researchers have shown that the very same fatty foods that cause heart attacks also appear to increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease, and, and by a lot. I'm talking about bacon grease and dairy fat and all that kind of stuff. The saturated fat is a bit, one, one of many drivers. Um, <clears throat> but when we're speaking of brain health, we're not only speaking of sort of later life dementia. We're also talking about how you feel today or this morning. And we have done a number of studies where we have been looking at when, when people start a plant-based diet to lose weight or to track, tackle diabetes or something like that. We also kind of surreptitiously track what's happening with how they feel, what, what's going on with their mood. And you can do this with paper and pencil tests. Uh, you can rate depression, you can rate anxiety, you can look at job absenteeism, are, are you able to work or not, and that kind of thing. And what we find uh, quite consistently is that when people follow plant-based diets, depression goes down, anxiety goes down, job, job absenteeism goes down, all these things go down. Now, the, then, then the next question is, why? And I think there are several reasons. I think part of it is, let's face it, if you lose 30 or 45 pounds, you feel better. You know, you feel, you feel just as you were saying, you feel more power, you feel... Um, for want of a better word, you just feel pumped up um, because you've conquered problems. You know, when, when you no longer have diabetes, I mean, that feels fantastic. When your doctor says, I'm going to cut your medicines in half. No, I'm going to take you off your medicine. Those all feel fantastic. But there's more to it. You mentioned the gut microbiome, the bacteria that are in your digestive tract. Uh, a meaty, dairy-rich diet fosters the growth of unhealthy bacteria. Plant-based foods, beans, vegetables, whole grains, fruits, increase the, they really foster the growth of healthy bacteria that feed back to the brain. Uh, they make neurotransmitters themselves. Um, and finally, the, when the brain, when we look at people who have depression, they very often have a chronic inflammatory condition in their body. Um, their cells are making inflammatory compounds that affect the brain. Uh, on a plant-based diet, the inflammation goes down, they feel better. So why do people feel better? W why is their energy better? Why is their depression down? Is it because physically they're healthier and that just makes you, you pumped up? Is it that their gut is healthier? Is it that they're not so inflamed? Is it something else? The answer is all of the above. Mm. In terms of um, the Alzheimer's prevention, are there any Dr. Neil Barnard's power foods which you could suggest to us which would be great in preventing or perhaps even maybe reversing some effects caused by Alzheimer's? Um, yeah, uh, let me, certain things I would favor and certain things I would not favor. 
Um, the things to get away from, we already mentioned. The foods that are high in, in bad fat, saturated fat, dairy, that's number one. Get away from the dairy, the cheese. Yes, I know that some people watching this program, they say, look, I'm addicted to cheese. How, I, can't, I can't live without it. I feel your pain, but cheese doesn't love you back. It's a maladaptive relationship, and it's time to end it now. Um, and that's true for meat. You know, meat is the second biggest source of saturated fat after cheese and, and dairy products. Breaking up with them is a really great idea. Um, let me also suggest uh, snack foods that often have the trans fats in them. Get away from those. And there's a special place in hell for people who are ruining healthy plant-based foods. You can have wonderful vegan foods, but over the past couple of years, people are packing coconut oil and palm oil in them, and that's not healthy. That's a saturated fat too. So look for the ones that don't have that. Um, be careful about your cookware. Uh, don't cook in aluminum pots and pans if the aluminum is touching the food, because aluminum can be a brain toxin too. Uh, same with iron. We're in love with our cast iron pan, uh, but especially for men, you know, women will women in their reproductive years will lose a little bit of blood every month, and so their iron levels tend to stay low. Older women and men at any age tend to store too much iron, and iron can goof, goof up the brain too. So I'm a big fan of stainless steel cookware or, or non-stick cookware, not the aluminum and not the, the iron. So with regard to things to, so that's all the stuff to not do. Um, the things to do, uh, before I get to, to food, do lace up your sneakers and go out for a good run because if you pump, get your heart pumping, it gets oxygen to the brain, it gets the toxins out, so exercise is good. Do make sure you sleep. Yes, I know there's a lot of great stuff for to stay awake for on the internet, but it's good to knock off once in a while and, and let your brain rest. Your brain needs to rest. But with regard to food, uh, we there are four food groups that are important, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, but within them, look for color. Um, the carrots or sweet potatoes, yams, that orange color is beta carotene. That's an antioxidant. That's important. Uh, tomatoes, that red color, that's lycopene. That's an antioxidant. Vitamin E rich foods, those are the nuts and seeds. Those are antioxidants. Think about blueberries, um, grapes. Uh, those, the, 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 the pigments are, you're often a guide to antioxidants that have protected the plant and they can protect you too. So uh, eat for color. Interesting that you mentioned um, tomatoes. Are you not a believer in this argument for lectins and the avoidance oh, of them? Oh No, I don't think lectins are really important, to tell you the truth. I know there's um, been kind of a fad to avoid lectins. Um, and I think the thing to, to recognize is that there are a lot of compounds in plants. Um, if, you, if you were to eat raw beans, I mean dried beans, first of all, you would break a tooth trying to do that. And if you did, you would get a lot of lectins. But when you cook them, it really becomes a non-issue. So I don't think you need to worry about lectins. The reason I mentioned tomatoes is at half a mile away, you can see the lycopene that's in them. That's, the, that's what makes them a bright red color. And lycopene isn't just a healthy, it's a cousin of beta carotene. The orange carrot has beta carotene. Lycopene is the tomato version of that. And it's an antioxidant that will help protect you against uh, oxidative processes. I think that this has been amazing. Before we get, uh, you know, where our audience can connect with you and, uh, you know, where we can point them towards the book, we always ask one last question. And this isn't related to your research, although it may be, but we always ask at the end of every podcast, what makes a life worth living? Wow, what a fabulous question. Um, uh, allow me to be brief. Um, in my own view of the world, I don't believe that I am trying to st rack up points for uh, an enjoyable afterlife. My feeling is that this is it. I don't know quite how I got here. And I'm not sure how any of us got here. But I think that we do have a couple things that we can do. Um, my view is that we do what we can to alleviate suffering in whatever forms it takes, whether that's human suffering or animal suffering or destroying a planet. To do what we can to alleviate suffering, I think, is our highest calling. Beyond that, once you've uh, done your duty for the day to eliminate suffering, there are some things that we can do to beautify the world, whether it's through music or through kindness or other things. 
and that's job two. Oh, I thought that was a beautiful answer. Um, and let me put my gratitude to you because a lot of people which I've talked to, they've all said, go and speak to Neil, go and speak to Neil. He's doing incredible things. And, and I do have to put my gratitude because it is true. Could you tell our audience where they could connect with you and also about your work going forward? Oh, well, well thank you for asking that. Um, our website is pcrm.org. That stands for the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, pcrm.org. Um, and so uh, if you go there, you'll see lots of, of information. Uh, and we are on all the social media channels as well. And we have an app that's called the 21 Day Vegan Challenge. And this is for people who say, okay, this might be a good thing, but I'm not sure it's going to really work for me, and I'll probably get divorced if I go vegan. Uh, let me just try it. So you just take, you just map out three weeks and you just try it. It's kind of like drive, you know, test driving your car before you buy. So it's called the 21 Day Vegan uh, Kickstart. 21 Day Vegan Kickstart. It's on your iPhone or your Android or whatever, and download it and have at it. And your body in balance is available on Amazon. If possible, please buy from local bookstores. But Neil, this has been such a pleasure. Everything will be linked below. I really can't thank you enough for coming on the show. It's been such a privilege. Well, I want to I want to thank you. You know, in any given day, a doctor might see fifteen patients, twenty patients if they're busy or something like that. But one of your programs reaches a lot of people, huge number of people, and you educate them and you inspire them, and you you'll never know how many lives you save, but I guarantee you'll save many. So, thank you for including me in this.